Thanks, everyone, for coming. We will, uh, so on these Thursday lectures, what we'll do, what we'll keep doing is going through the same problems that are already uploaded online. Uh, I'll start with problem number one in the packet. So this problem here, it talks about uh, an electric demand water heater. So it's heating up water. So it's important for us to know if the water is being heated up or cooled down, if the fluid is uh, heating up or cooling down. And it, we're, it has a given flow rate, right? And it tells us that the, well, the heater is a 10 meter long, three centimeter diameter pipe with a uniform heat flux. So the boundary conditions are gonna be important. We're asked to find the needed heat flux and the heat pipe surface temperature at the demand water heater. So I don't think we need to find the needed heat flux. Oh no, yeah, we do have to find the heat flux because we don't know, we just know that it's uniform. And the flow rate, uh, so first we do that when the flow rate is one liter per minute. And then we're asked to do the same if we increase the flow rate up to two liters per minute. So this problem's a little bit longer, so I didn't want to do it last class. So here we, should, we see a picture of our pipe. It, um, it has an inlet, right? So it has this temperature inlet of 15 degrees. And at least initially, we have this volumetric flow rate of one liter per minute. We know the length of the pipe and its diameter. We know that there's a uniform heat flux, but we don't know what it is. We know that our outlet temperature has to be 45 degrees Celsius. And we're asked to find some things. So first we want what the numerical value of the heat flux is. And then we want to know the temperature on the surface of the pipe at the outlet. And then we'll do both the heat flux and the surface temperature at 20 liters per minute. So first, when we go through problems like this, we want to know what the assumptions are. So our first assumption is that the pipe has a constant heat flux. Our second assumption is that the fluid and material properties are constant. Our third assumption is that the pipe is at steady state and that we have no losses to the surroundings so that all the heat coming from the wall, all this heat flux goes into our fluid. So the nice thing about internal convection is that if we think about this systematically, we can follow the same process that we would for external convection. So first we wanna understand the geometry and boundary conditions. We wanna find properties at a particular temperature, temperature that makes sense. Then we find our Reynolds number. When we know our Reynolds number, we can figure out what the right correlation that we need to apply is. Then once we have the correlation, we can find the heat transfer coefficient. And with the heat transfer coefficient, we can hopefully solve the problem. So in this problem, we'll start by looking at the geometry and the boundary conditions for the problem. We know that we have internal flow, that we have a constant heat flux, and that we have a round pipe. So when we talked last class, we know that we need to figure out if we're fully developed or if we're developing. And then we need to find the Reynolds number so we can figure out if we're laminar or we're turbulent. So whether, you know, where this full development happens is a function of whether or not the flow is laminar or turbulent. And then once we know that, if we know that we're fully developed, then we can use these correlations and if we know the boundary conditions, then we can get the right correlation for our nozzle number. In this case, we have a circular pipe, but even if we didn't have a circular pipe, we would use equations that look like this, although maybe we would use the hydraulic diameter, or if it was a laminar flow, if you remember from last lecture, we also had a table for different laminar flows if we were talking about ducts with particular aspect ratios. The next thing we want to do is determine relevant properties at, appropriate, at an appropriate temperature. So we do this so we can find our Reynolds number. For internal flow, the appropriate temperature is going to be the average temperature of the fluid moving through the pipe. So we take the inlet temperature plus the outlet temperature and we divide by two. 
So that's what I'm doing here. I find my average temperature. In this case, it's nice. We know both our inlet and outlet temperatures for our fluid. So we can see that our average temperature is 300 degrees, which is 303 degrees Kelvin. Here I'm going to say that's about 300 so that I can read this off the table. If you said that this was 305, which is actually probably even a better answer, uh, that'd be fine on a test. You could take the average of these two numbers too. But if this was a test, I think it's nice to conserve time. So I would probably just pick one of the lines off the table here. If I do that, I can find my density, which is one over the specific volume. I don't know if you remember from thermodynamics, but when you look up on these tables, if you have a subscript F, that's talking about the liquid, and a subscript G, that's talking about the vapor. So if this was all steam, then we would have to use the V sub G. We'll use the kinematic viscosity, which is not actually on this table, but we can take the dynamic viscosity, which is here on the table, and then we can divide by the density. One of the things that's tricky here, and again, maybe you remember this from thermo, because here it's got a number times 10 to the power of 6. That means that the number on the table has already been multiplied by 10 to the power of 6. So if you want the real number, you have to take the number that's on the table and divide by 10 to the power of 6. And that's why we get such a small number, because then we have to divide by the, vis by the density, which is approximately 1,000 for water. We take the thermal conductivity of the fluid. Again, we, this one we can just read off the table. And then we can find the Prandtl number for the fluid from the table as well. Again, we're taking all these numbers with the subscript F because we're talking about a liquid. So this is good. The last problem was a little bit nicer that we did at the end of last class because we had values that were given to us. So we didn't have to look anything up on a table. Oh, sorry, I forgot that we'll need also the specific heat here because we'll want to know the heat that's added to our fluid that moves to the pipe. So you can see, you know, if you're doing this on a test or something, here on the slide, I sort of know which properties I need. And if you can kind of get in the right headspace to get these particular properties, then, you know, you can get them. But if you, you know, if you pick off a number that you didn't need or if you end up needing a number, you can always go back. So once we have these properties, we'll use them to calculate our Reynolds number. And it's not written here, but we'll also at this time figure out if we're fully developed or not. So I have this equation for my Reynolds number. I'm not given the velocity in the pipe, but I am given the volumetric flow rate. So if I take the volumetric flow rate and divide by the cross-sectional area of the pipe, then I'll be taking meters cubed per second divided by meters squared. So I will get a velocity in meters per second. So I put these numbers into my calculator. I simplify it a little bit. So here I can see my velocity in case I ever need it later. And then I can find my Reynolds number. Now the reason we have the Reynolds number, first we, we might need it in a correlation, but second we want to see if we have a laminar or a turbulent flow. And in this case, transition for internal flow happens at approximately Reynolds numbers of 2,300. So here we're less than that, so we assume that we have a laminar flow. So we know it's laminar flow. We want to see if it's fully developed. So we're hoping that it's fully developed because then we can use the correlations that I showed earlier in the slide deck instead of uh, trying to read something off a graph or using a more complicated um, correlation. So in laminar flows, we have to worry about two different entrance lengths. So it takes a different distance in a laminar flow to develop the hydrodynamic boundary layer and to develop the thermal boundary layer. So for the hydrodynamic shown here in green, we use the equation here, 0 0.05 multiplied by the Reynolds number multiplied by the diameter. So I know all of those numbers and I get an entrance length. So I assume that my flow is fully developed in the velocity profile once I'm 1.24 meters down the pipe. 
So this is fully developed most of the way because my pipe is 10 meters long. So now I need to do the same for my thermal boundary layer. I have to find my thermal entrance length. So here I could do this whole equation again, but if you notice the beginning of the equation is the same. So here I can write this thermal entrance length just as the hydrodynamic entrance length multiplied by the Prandtl number. Now our Prandtl number was greater than one, so our hydrodynamic entrance length is longer, or is sh our hydrodynamic entrance length is shorter than our thermal entrance length. It looks like I made a mistake on the slide here. So all of these blue numbers should be sub FD comma T like it is up here. So this everything in blue is the thermal entrance length. And that's just over seven meters. So here it's developing thermally for most of the length of the pipe. But we're asked to solve what's going on at the end of the pipe. So we're still fully developed at the end of the pipe because the pipe is 10 meters long. So next, we know that it's laminar and we know that it's fully developed. So now we want to pick the right convection correlation. So here, we know it's not turbulent. So because it's not turbulent, we can get rid of these turbulent correlations. Then we also know that we have a uniform heat flux and not a uniform temperature. The nice thing about the laminar correlations is that we don't even have to do any math. It's just a constant value. So here I know that my Nusselt number in this case is 4.36. So now that I have the appropriate correlation and a value for Nusselt number, I can solve for the heat transfer coefficient. So again, there's not much math to do to solve the Nusselt number because I already have a value, but I'm still going to use the definition of the Nusselt number. And because this is a circular pipe, my characteristic length is the diameter of the pipe. I can rearrange this to get a heat transfer coefficient. I do some math and I find that the heat transfer coefficient is just over 89 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And it's good, it's always nice to know the heat transfer coefficient in these problems because that's part of what we're trying to do. I mean really that's kind of the objective I guess of week one and week two is how do we find H. But this problem, it's not just asking us for H, right? So we want to find the surface temperature at the end of the pipe. So we know H. And now we're trying to find what's going on at X is equal to L. So what's going on at the end of the pipe? We're trying to find the temperature. So here, that temperature, I know that if I do Newton's law and I do and I draw my control surface just on the pipe wall, then I know that all the heat that's being emitted from the pipe, this heat flux, is going into the fluid. So there's convection into the fluid, and that's going to be H times the temperature of the surface of the pipe minus the temperature of the outlet of the fluid. So now I have an equation to get the surface temperature for the pipe. Unfortunately, I don't know the heat flux yet. So because I don't know the heat flux, I can't get a numerical answer for the surface temperature of the pipe yet. So now I can think, how do I get the first, or how do I get the heat flux? So the nice thing is that I know the temperature of the fluid coming in, and I know the temperature of the fluid going out. So now I can think about this maybe like I thought about um, heat exchangers in thermodynamics class. And I know that all the heat that's coming in from the pipe is going to go in to heating my fluid. So the heat that comes into my pipe is the heat flux multiplied by the surface area of the pipe. So that's the, the sort of wetted perimeter of the pipe multiplied by the length. We'll get to the math. And then all of that heat is going to go into the fluid. So that's going to be M dot times the specific heat times the change in temperature of the fluid. So here, I can uh, I know these things, right? So I can rearrange to try to isolate for the heat flux. I'm not given the mass flow rate, but I know the volumetric flow rate. So if I take the volumetric flow rate times the density, 
then I can get the mass flow rate. This is why I had to look up the specific heat on the table. So I may, if I didn't look up the specific heat, then I would get to this point in the problem and say, oh, I don't have the specific heat. And then I'd have to go back to the table. So it's okay if you forget. But I know all these values now, and I can put them into my calculator and check my units here. And I get an answer in watts per meter squared, which is nice because it's heat flux. And that the value is 2,210. So this is nice because now I know the heat flux, which was actually part A of the problem. So maybe I could have done this first right after I looked up my, um, my properties. But I kind of like to follow this systematic process. And now we know H, right? We already talked about this, that we can do sort of a first law analysis looking at the surface and the fluid at the end of the pipe. And I got this equation for the surface temperature at the end of the pipe. But at the time, I didn't know Q double prime. Now I do know that, so I can put that back into my equation, and I know everything else. And I find that the temperature of the surface at the outlet of the pipe is just under 70 degrees Celsius. So now we've done part A and B of the problem. I'll pause just to see if there's any questions. Feel free to unmute yourself or to write questions in the chat. So up until this point, we've done kind of a laminar analysis of flow inside a pipe. And the next part of the problem, it asks us, well, what happens when we increase the volumetric flow rate by a factor of 20? So we go from one liter per minute up to 20 liters per minute, right? And I have the flow rate also in meters cubed per second here. So now, I've already sort of done the framework of the problem, so I kind of know some things about what's going on in the fluid. So I'm going to jump right to finding what the heat flux goes to. So here you can see that my heat flux is going to change. The surface area of my pipe doesn't change, but my mass flow rate went up by a factor of 20. My inlet and outlet temperatures, along with the specific heat, that's all going to stay the same. So my heat flux is actually going to go up by a factor of 20. So my heat flux now, in this case with the much higher flow rate, is 44,163 watts per meter squared. So it's nice. I still got the right units. But we see that as we increase the flow rate to maintain the same temperature difference of the fluid, we really have to increase the flow rate. Or we have to increase the heat flux. So we have to put more heat into the fluid because we're heating up so much more mass because we're pushing so much more mass through the system. So now I'm going to use properties to calculate the Reynolds number. So most of these properties, they were all based on the average temperature of the fluid, which hasn't changed. My inlet temperature and my outlet temperatures are the same. So my fluid properties are the same. But my Reynolds number changes a little bit because my velocity has gone up by a factor of 20 because my volumetric flow rate went up by a factor of 20. So my Reynolds number used to be 824, but now it's almost 16,500. So, I mean, maybe I'm spoiling the surprise here, but, you know, last time it was turbulent, or last time it was laminar, but now we've increased the flow rate enough that we're expecting to have turbulent flow inside of our pipe. So it's turbulent flow, we still need to know, though, if it's fully developed. Now, we expect turbulent flows to develop more quickly than laminar flows because you get better mixing inside the flow. But we'll have a look here. Our entrance lengths for both the hydrodynamic and thermal boundary layers are expected to be the same in turbulent flow. So we expect fully developed flows hydrodynamically and thermally once we get 10 diameters into the pipe. We know our diameter here. And so I see that our entrance length is expected to be 0.3 meters. Now we have this 10 meter long pipe. So both of these things are um, fully developed most of the way. 
So now I can pick my new nuzzle number correlation. Unlike last time, it's not laminar. So now we can get rid of the laminar correlations. Because we weren't told that it was rough or transitional, we're going to assume that it's smooth. But we still have another choice to make here. We need to know if we're heating up the fluid or cooling the fluid down. Or at least the way it's written in this equation is the surface temperature higher or lower than the fluid temperature. Now here, because we have a heat flux, we're heating the fluid up. And if we're heating the fluid up, it must mean that the surface temperature of the fluid is larger than the fluid temperature. Or the surface temperature of the pipe is larger than the fluid temperature. So we know that N here must be 0 0.4. So I put that into my equation, and now I have a new Nusselt number correlation. I know my Nusselt number correlation. I have all of these values. And I see that the Nusselt number is now 110. I use the definition of the Nusselt number to find my heat transfer coefficient. And my heat transfer coefficient has increased to 2,249 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So the analysis part, the symbolic solution here for finding the surface temperature of the pipe at the exit is the same. But my heat flux has changed, and my heat transfer coefficient has changed. So I put these new numbers into my equation, and I find that the surface temperature is now 64.7 degrees Celsius. I think before it was just under 70, so the surface temperature here is a little bit less than it was in the previous case. And that's because we're, we're using this turbulent flow now, so the heat transfer coefficient went up, right? So the heat transfer is more efficient from the surface to the fluid, which means that the resistance is smaller, which means that the temperature difference is smaller. Does anyone have any questions about the first example problem here? Okay, we will move to the second problem. Although the second problem is actually problem three on the is this the right one? Yeah, problem three on the handout because we did this second problem on the handout last class. So this one's somewhat similar. I mean, all these. Hopefully, when we look at sort of the systematic way that we're doing this, hopefully you're starting to see that these internal convection problems are all kind of the same, and even that the internal convection problems are kind of the same as the external convection problems. So in this case, we have air at 10 degrees Celsius. It enters an 18 meter long rectangular duct with a particular cross section and a particular velocity. The duct is subjected to a uniform radiation heating for the entire surface at a rate of 400 watts per meter squared. So just like last time, we have a constant heat flux, but this time we're told what it is. We're asked to find the wall temperature at the exit of the duct. So this problem will probably look pretty similar to the last problem that we did. If we're drawing it out, it would look like this. We have our pipe at the bottom. We know the inlet temperature. We know the velocity at the inlet. We're told the length of the pipe. We know the heat flux. We also know the cross section of the pipe, which I haven't written here. And then we're asked to find the temperature of the surface at the outlet. So now that we've drawn our problem out, oh, so here um, we can find right away when it's rectangular, we know we're going to need the hydraulic diameter. So I can find that out right away. So here I have four times the cross-sectional area divided by the wetted perimeter. So the wetted perimeter is just the perimeter that's touching the fluid. So if there was some confusion about the problem, because maybe we had some thickness of whatever sheet metal they're using to make this duct, then we want the perimeter on the inside that touches the fluid and not the perimeter on the outside. We know the length and width of the duct so we can uh, calculate our hydraulic diameter. So 
So now we'll make some assumptions. So we're told that the pipe has a constant heat flux. That there's, we're going to assume that the fluid and material properties are constant. If you're ever looking to write something down on an exam, uh, you may notice we make this assumption every time. So that's a good one. We're going to assume that this problem is at steady state and that there's no losses to the surroundings. So again, this is saying that all this radiation heat that's coming in goes into the fluid. So it goes from the pipe to the fluid. And we'll see, I mean, I guess for all of these problems, when you're doing them on an exam, we often will ask what the assumptions are early in the question. But as you go through the question, maybe you find some other assumptions that you make. So it's good to write those down. We'll follow the same process that we've done before, starting with understanding the geometry and the boundary conditions. So we know that this is an internal flow and not an external flow and that there's constant heat flux and that it's a square or a rectangular cross-section, I think is more accurate. So it's internal flow, but we don't know what the Reynolds number is, so we don't know if it's laminar or turbulent. We do know that because it's a rectangular cross-section, we'll use the hydraulic diameter in these equations. But we'd have to figure out if the flow is fully developed or not. And then once we know that, we can pick nozzle number correlation. But in order to find a Reynolds number, we need to know our fluid properties. So we take those fluid properties at the average temperature between the inlet and the outlet of our, excuse me, of our duct. The tricky part here is unlike the last problem, we don't know the outlet temperature yet. So in the notes, what I said is what you do here is you kind of guess and check. And then, you know, so you guess a value and then you can check it out at the end. So even though conceptually this problem is similar to the last problem, you know, every problem's got its own wrinkles. So you might come out with different sort of difficulties in between. So here, um, I, I've again drawn the problem out. I want to do the first law analysis on the pipe. So I know the heat flux. I know the area. I'm told the velocity, so hopefully I can find the mass flow rate. And then I can find CP if I knew the properties, right? So basically in here, if I knew the properties of the fluid, then I could find CP and I could use that to find the outlet temperature of the fluid. But I need to know the outlet temperature of the fluid before I can find CP. So it's kind of a bit of a catch-22, right? I never read that book, so... I just assume that it's kind of like a catch-22, I guess. So I'm going to guess an average temperature here. I'm going to guess a number that's on my tables. So I'll use 300 degrees Kelvin uh, or 44 degrees Celsius. So now I go to my textbook, and I need to find properties of air. So the reason I picked 300 is because it's on my table here. What you can see here, this gives me a little bit of hope because my table... There's 50 degrees differences here between all the temperatures on my table. So that either means that whoever made the table made a really bad decision, or it means that the properties of the fluid, in this case air, don't change very much with temperature. So if you look on the tables, a lot of these properties stay pretty constant. So that's it's encouraging. It means that uh, maybe the accuracy of my guess doesn't matter too much. So I've assumed that the average temperature here is 300. So I'll pull some numbers off my table. I get a density, a kinematic viscosity. So again, here I take the, oh, it's actually right on the table, so I don't even have to do the math. Um, so it's, we're told, and again, you gotta make sure you read the numbers off the table correctly. So this uh, new times 10 to the power of six means that I have to divide these numbers by 10 to the power of six. I know the thermal conductivity, I know the Prandtl number, and I know the specific heat. So when I look here, none of these numbers change too much with temperature, so I'm hoping that my, um, my guesses are okay here, but we'll check at the end. So now that we know CP, I can put that into my equation for the first law on the fluid moving through the pipe and I can find the outlet temperature of the fluid. 
and I get that it's 42 degrees. So 42 degrees. Oh, this is just the outlet temperature. So actually, you know, I guess that the average temperature was 300, right? So then to get an average temperature of 300, I need an outlet temperature of 44 degrees. So I'm a little bit off, but those properties didn't change too much with temperature. So I'm just going to leave it. But if I was dealing with a problem that's super complicated, like I guess the example that I always use is, you know, this idea of trying to land a satellite on an asteroid, uh, then maybe I'd have to iterate till I actually got numbers that converged. So now we're going to try to use the properties that we have to find a Reynolds number and figure out if we're fully developed. So I have an equation for Reynolds number here. I know all the values in my equation. So I work this out and I get that my Reynolds number is pretty high, almost 50,000. That's much bigger than 2,300. So I know that my flow is turbulent. I know that it's turbulent, but I got to figure out if it's fully developed as well. So the nice thing about turbulent flow is that the entrance length for the hydraulic and thermal problems are the same. It happens at about 10 diameters into the pipe or 1.7 meters in this case. So we're fully developed most of the way. Remember, it's, I guess, not explicitly shown here, but I'm using the hydraulic diameter in this problem. Now that I know the Reynolds number, I can choose the appropriate convection correlation. So here we know that we're not laminar. Again, we're going to assume that we're smooth. So I guess I could write that down in my assumptions. And we know, again, we're adding heat from the wall of the duct into the fluid. So we have the surface temperature must be hotter than the fluid temperature. So N is equal to 0 0.4. So I can use that to find H. So here I'm going to use my correlation here in red. And that's going to be equal to the definition of my Nusselt number. I put some numbers into my calculator and I get a value for the Nusselt number of 112. This is dimensionless. All the different components of this calculation are dimensionless. So uh, if you get any units in this one, uh, we messed up somewhere. I can use the definition of the Nusselt number to find the heat transfer coefficient. I put some numbers into my calculator and I find that H is just over 17 watts per meter squared Kelvin. With that, I can solve the temperature in th of the surface at the end of my pipe. So this is just like the last problem. What we're doing here is we're doing a first law analysis with a surface a control surface on sort of the wall of our pipe. So we know that the heat flux that's coming off the pipe goes into convection from the pipe surface to the fluid. So we know the temperature at the outlet now, we know the heat flux, and we know H. So I can put these numbers into my calculator, check my units, and I get that my temperature of the surface at the outlet is 65.3 degrees Celsius. So does anyone have questions about this problem? I think sort of the take home message here is that, you know, just like the other ones, if we follow this process, at least we'll know where to start, which I think a lot of times is the hardest part. But you can see that there's different wrinkles in the problem. So, you, you know, you might hit, you know, a speed bump that you haven't seen. And maybe the best way, if you're thinking about preparing for a final exam, maybe the best way to do that is to look at as many problems as you can in the textbook. You don't have to solve every problem in the textbook because that would take too much time. But I think it's not a bad idea to look at a whole bunch of different problems and kind of simulate the first five minutes you'd see on an exam. So look at the problem, 
try to figure out, okay, what's the process that I'm going to use to solve that problem? And then try to identify maybe what the wrinkle is or where the hiccup might be and try to see like, oh, I, I think I can get that, right? Or, or in, like in this case, oh, I'm not given the temperature at the outlet, so that means I have to do some kind of assumption. And then I would go through and try to check it. So that would be my advice. Um, you know, don't spend a ton of time doing a bunch of questions reviewing for the exam. Try to spend a little time on a lot of different problems so you can see as many different potential wrinkles as the textbook offers. Ah, this is from Emily, so we can go through this. But it says, now you have knowledge of the transfer of heat. So I think that's good. Hopefully. Hopefully we feel that way, right? Okay, so this is our third and final problem that we'll go over today. Here we have an electronic circuit board. It's dissipating 50 watts, and it's sandwiched between two ducted forced air cooled heat sinks. So if we look at the problem here, the chip, I guess, is the kind of, I don't know what color that is, like pink or coral or something, and it's sandwiched in between two different channel heat sinks here so we're cooling the chip on both sides so we have to remember that when we're sort of calculating our area or looking at how many channels that there are is that there's an array of channels on top and an array of channels on the bottom and half the heat is going to go into each one of those um, heat sinks so the aluminum heat sinks uh, were given the geometry and we're saying that the fins are one millimeter thick the atmospheric air at volumetric flow rate we're given, and the temperature. We're asked to estimate the operating temperature of the board. For now, we'll assume that the flow is fully developed, although we can probably check that, and that the internal surfaces are isothermal, and the fin efficiencies are 100%. So the reason it says that part at the end is that in real life, you would see, if we look at sort of the cross-section of the, of the heat sinks, the temperature would be highest near the chip and then the temperature would drop as we move up, right? So we're going to assume that the fin efficiencies are 100%. Remember when we do fins, having a real great fin efficiency is not necessarily a good thing. It just means that the temperature is the same everywhere on the fin. Um. I won't do this last part, the comment on the assumptions at the end. That's, uh, there's some documentation on that if you look at the handwritten solutions on the My Courses webpage. So there's a lot of information in this problem statement, but I'll try to draw out what's going on. So here, if we look at kind of an individual channel, we know the temperature going in, we know the total volumetric flow rate, we know the length of each channel, we know that the surface temperature is constant, so it's a little bit different than the other problems we've done where the heat flux was constant. We don't know the temperature at the outlet, but we do know how much heat is coming off of our chip. Again, we have a non-circular cross-section, so I'm going to try to find the hydraulic diameter. I know enough information to do this, so I can find the hydraulic diameter of each one of my channels. So after I draw out the problem, I like to go through my assumptions, or at least whatever initial assumptions I feel like I'm going to make. So I'm going to assume that the heating temperature is uniform, and so that it's got 100% fin efficiency. We're going to assume that the fluid and material properties are constant and that the system is at steady state, and that there's no losses to the surroundings. So you can see there's a lot of commonality in the assumptions that we'll make for these internal flow problems. We'll go through this process. So we want to understand our geometry. We have internal flow, a constant surface temperature, and we have rectangular channels again. Again, we want to find our entrance lengths, which are dependent on the Reynolds number, because we need to know if we're laminar or turbulent. 
we're always sort of hoping for fully developed flow because then we can use um, these correlations here. Although I guess if it's not fully developed, then we'll just use different correlations. So it's not the end of the world. Next, we want to find relevant properties at an appropriate temperature. Just like the last problem we did, we don't know the outlet temperature yet. So we'll have to make some assumptions. So we can do the first law on the pipe. We know the volumetric flow rate. We know the temperature at the inlet, and we're trying to find the fluid temperature at the outlet. So I know that all the heat that goes in has to go into the fluid if there's no losses to the surroundings. And just like last time, I don't know T out and I don't know CP, but if I want a really good value for CP, I kind of have to know T out to find T average. So I'll have to make an assumption again. I guess I like 300 degrees Kelvin because I'm going to use it again. And if I use 300 degrees Kelvin, right, then I can just pick numbers again off my table. This is still air, so these will actually be the same properties that we did last time. So I'm getting the density, the kinematic viscosity, the thermal conductivity, the Prandtl number, and the specific heat. I guess one thing that you do have to be careful about here is look at the units. So I've done some unit conversion by myself. So here it tells me CP in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. But I guess I'm foreshadowing that I, I turned this into joules per kilogram Kelvin because I'm going to use joules later in the problem. You can keep this as kilojoules, but just like we did in thermo, it's always good to carry your units through your problem because uh, it's, it's a bit like cheating, right? You can see if you messed up somewhere. So now we have an, uh, an assumption for what CP could be. Our mass flow rate becomes our density multiplied by our volumetric flow rate. So I can isolate for T out. So this is the fluid temperature at the outlet. I know some values. And the reason I guess you can see here, so I the the chip told us in watts, right? So it said it was producing watts. So then if I put my CP in joules per kilogram, then I can go to watts, right? So once I have joules per second, that's watts. But if I kept if I kept this as one kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin, then I would get kilowatts. And I'd have to remember to either divide the numerator by a thousand or multiply the denominator by a thousand. So you can look at sort of the units you're given at the beginning of the problem and try to convert early. But it, even if you do that, it's good to carry your units through to check to make sure that you uh, do it correctly. So here I see that my outlet temperature is 27.7 degrees. So that's nice that the, the air temperature in my heat sink stays pretty constant and 27 is basically 300 so my average temperature here is not 300 but it's 300.3 and as we saw last time for air most of these properties are kind of a weak function of temperature so they don't change very much with temperature so I mean my assumptions off but not by very much so now we'll use our properties to calculate a Reynolds number and figure out if we're fully developed. So again, my Reynolds number, the equation I like to use has a velocity in it, but instead of using velocity, or instead of being told velocity, I'm told the volumetric flow rate. So I have to divide by the cross-sectional area. It's important here when we do this, this is, I guess, the total cross-sectional area in all the heat sinks, the way that I've set this up. So here, I guess I, I multiplied my denominator by 24 because there's 24 different channels. I could have also thought about the volumetric flow rate through one channel, and then I would have taken the volumetric flow rate on the top here and divided the top by 24, right? So you get the same answer numerically, which is it's always good if doing the problem two different ways gives you the same answer. But we do have to sort of be aware Right, and, and sort of think about what's going on. So as much as I like to have sort of a systematic process, I can't just turn my brain off and follow the process. I do have to think throughout the process as well. 
Here, if I calculate my velocity here, in case I ever needed it, it's 16.7 meters per second. And then I can get my Reynolds number as just over 10,000. Just over 10,000 is bigger than 2,300. So again, we have a turbulent flow, which makes sense. I mean, when you're trying to get better heat transfer, moving from laminar to turbulent, because you get this chaotic mixing inside the fluid, you get more efficient heat transfer. So you'll get higher heat transfer coefficients in turbulence than in laminar flow. So if you're ever designing a heat exchange device, you probably want your flow to be turbulent. So once we know it's turbulent, we can ask ourselves if it's fully developed. So we want to know what the entrance lengths are. And in turbulent flow, the hydrodynamic and thermal entrance lengths are the same. And it happens at 10 diameters inside the pipe. So we can work this out. And it's just under 10 centimeters into the pipe. So both flows are developing most of the way, but developed at the end. So because we're asked what's going on at the end of the pipe, I think this will be OK. So we're going to assume that we can use these uh, fully developed correlations. So we're going to choose the appropriate convection correlation. So here, uh, because it's turbulent, it's not laminar, we're going to say that it's smooth. And in this case, the surface temperature is, again, higher than the fluid temperature because we're, you know, the heat sink is hot. We're trying to remove heat. So the fluid is the sort of heat sink here. So as the air moves through our channels, the air temperature increases, right? That's why if you ever sort of put your hand, uh, you know, by the outlet air that's coming out of your computer somewhere, if you're putting your laptop actually on your lap, you'll notice that there's heat there, right? And part of that is, you know, the air that gets heated up. Or as my daughter says, hot it up. We're still learning heat transfer at home. Right, so we have the value of n. We can use now our correlation to find our heat transfer coefficient. We know that n is 0.4, so we put that into our equation. We can calculate our Reynolds number. Again, this is a dimensionless parameter, so if you see some units in here, it means you did something wrong. You can use your Nussle number definition to find the heat transfer coefficient. Put some numbers into your calculator, and you find that the heat transfer coefficient in this case is just under 90 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So now, when we have pipes with constant surface temperature, we end up using this sort of ratio of temperature differences. So it's the temperature difference at a particular length divided by the, so this is the, the temperature difference between the surface and the fluid at a particular length divided by the temperature difference between the surface and the fluid at the inlet. And that's going to be equal to this exponential term. So this is a function of x. So you apply this at a particular length down the pipe. So here, we know that the value of x we're going to use is 15 centimeters, right, which I think is L in this problem. So we're going to find the difference between the surface and the fluid at the length L. So we we have values for everything in this exponential term. It looks a little bit ugly. So again, I like to not put everything into my calculator at the same time. It takes a little bit longer to do, but I feel like I screw it up less often. I see that my term in the exponential is dimensionless, which is nice because I have a dimensionless number here, right? So it's a, it's a dimensionless temperature difference on the left-hand side of my equation. And I get that that's 0 0.76. So once I know what my dimensionless temperature difference looks like, now I can separate and isolate for the temperature at the surface. So I multiplied both sides by the denominator, and then I isolated for Ts, which is the temperature at the surface. And I don't have the, um, you know, so this is at the length x, or at the length l. But I guess it doesn't really matter in this case because the surface temperature is constant everywhere. So there really is just one surface temperature. So we're sort of using the information we have at the length L 
but you should get the same answer if you do this anywhere along the pipe. So I can isolate for TS, put some numbers into my calculator, and find that the temperature is 302.9 degrees Kelvin. So if I do that, um, then I can, uh, so I know this, right? So then I can convert back to Celsius, and I see that it's just under 30 degrees Celsius. So here, I think it's interesting. Whenever I'm left with over here, I've got a, a numerical value multiplied by a single temperature there. So that's why I used Kelvin here. It's always, you know, if you're ever in doubt using Kelvin or Rankin, I guess, if we're doing imperial problems, it's safer. So if you're ever in doubt, it's okay to do that. Oh, and that's the end. Oh, this is a riddle from Gabrielle. I don't think she got it exactly right here. Why do seagulls fly over the sea? Because otherwise, they would be bagels. I thought it was funny. So does anybody have questions about this problem? All right. Uh, does anybody have questions about the course in general or what's going on? I have posted... You, so I'm recording this as well. So I'm going to post the YouTube links to these lectures. And then we're working with the department. I guess we're getting TAs to caption these. And then I go through the captions. So... The, initially, the YouTube link will not have captions or just have whatever auto captions YouTube gives us. But uh, within, we're told the turnaround time is about a day. And, and I saw that on Tuesday. So within about 24 hours, we'll have um, captions on that as well. We do have the interpreters uh, on the video. And I think that the process that we used for that was a little bit better today because I think we've kind of isolated the the video for the interpreters, I think it's been up there all the time, whereas sometimes um, sometimes they got squished down into the corner. So I think that hopefully that's helpful too, but the caption should be in there within about 24 hours. So TM in this fluid. So M, I think, is a subscript that the textbook uses for the medium, which is maybe a fancy way of saying the fluid. So in all of these equations, uh, TS refers to the surface temperature, and T sub M refers to a fluid temperature. So T sub M at L is the temperature of the fluid at, the, at X is equal to L, and T sub M comma I is the temperature of the fluid at the inlet. I guess the one other, and those were given in the problem. Uh, the inlet temperature was given. We had to find, I believe, the outlet temperature of the fluid. It's hard because we did three problems here. What if we go back to the beginning? So here we're saying atmospheric air comes in at 27 degrees Celsius, but we weren't given the outlet temperature. So here, I'm going to just go through this quickly. Sorry about this. So when we did this, we didn't know the outlet temperature of the fluid. So we knew the inlet temperature of the fluid, but to find the outlet temperature of the fluid, we needed to make a guess of what the outlet temperature was first, and then that allowed us to get an approximation for the specific heat. And then once we had that, then we could calculate our, our uh, properties. You're welcome. So again, just a reminder too, so I'll post this video but separate videos that have been fully captioned are posted on the site for all of these example problems. And then we'll have this video as well, which is nice because it includes questions from, uh, from students. So I think that's good too. 
And then I think the transcripts for videos have been posted as well, as well as the PowerPoint slides, if you'd prefer to, to view them that way. One other um, point that I wanted to make was I've had a couple emails from people talking about how they have exams on the same day as heat. So if anyone else has an exam that's on the same day as heat transfer, please let me know. We're going to try to figure out how we're going to deal with conflicts. I think usually we only move exams when there's three exams on the same day. But we're still trying to figure out the process here. And if you have two exams on the same day, I think that it does sort of make sense to try not to have them on the same day just because you'll have to deal with uh, accessing the exam online and then at the end of the exam kind of, you know, taking pictures of it and uploading it like you do your homework. So certainly if you had exams back to back, I would want to to move them to at least give you some spacing. So if you're in that case and you have more than one exam on the same day as heat transfer, I've heard from, I think, two students already, but if anyone else is in that situation, please let me know. Uh, do you think it, it matters to move it? Because I do have two. I mean, I think a bunch of us have numerical methods and heat transfer on the same day. So I think the timing is the important part. I guess if there's hours... They've got a few hours between them. They're, one's at 11 and yours is at like 4.15. So I think for students, if you don't have extended time in a case like that, I think it's probably... Yeah, I wasn't going to move it, but I was just curious. Yeah, so I, I think what we're trying to do is at least compile all the information. So if you do have two exams on the same day, I think it's good for us to know... So I know Brittany okay. in the ME office is kind of spearheading this, but I think it's good for us to collect information as well. But if you could either send an email to me and CC Brittany or send an email to Brittany and CC me, I think that okay. would be good. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. So I think we don't exactly know the answer, but we're trying to get information so we can make an informed decision. Maybe the other thing, uh, this is I so I sent out an, a link yesterday to a podcast I was listening to from Planet Money, and I thought it was just really cool to see. I don't know if people listen to it or not, but it was about sort of a small ventilator manufacturer in I think Minnesota, and they produce you know maybe a hundred ventilators a month or something like that. But you know they got contacted by people from all across the world, and then partnered with GM because. GM has this enormous supply chain because a lot of the problem with scaling things up is that they couldn't get parts manufactured. So I thought it was just really cool to see sort of engineering and uh, supply chain management sort of come together. And I think they, they talked about dramatically increasing their ventilator production and sort of getting ventilators produced maybe in new ways with different suppliers and having those in hospitals before the end of the month. So... I just thought that was really cool uh, and it's neat to see kind of engineering in action, how it's more than just sort of doing physics and math, but that it's, uh, you know, working together to try to solve important societal problems. So if you have 25 minutes or so, I thought it was a cool listen. Other than that, I don't have anything else to share. So if there's no further questions, uh, you're free to, I mean, you're always free to leave. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, uh, you're free to, to leave the lectures, I guess, over if you don't have any other questions. Thanks, everyone.